Let's go on uh, to the next part of the program, which is the Nordisk Film and TV Fund Prize, our screenwriting award. And for that, I want to ask up on stage Petri Kempinen, CEO of Nordisk Film and TV Fund, and Sia Edstrom. Maybe let's just start, because you're the one that's going to talk about why you, you um, funded this award, which is now the second year. Yes. Uh it's because, I mean, the label of this seminar is actually the golden age of TV drama, isn't it? Yeah, the golden era, but Golden it's the era, same. so I actually <laughs> want it to be the platinum era. <laughs> and that's why uh, the prize. Uh, we came up with this uh, two, three years ago because we wanted to raise the status of TV drama, and especially we thought that we need to highlight the core of the TV drama, which is writing of it and creating the concept of of great TV series, and we were already five years ago in a situation where we talked about the golden age, and I think that we need to keep this age uh, going, but also at the same time think about the future and uh, the, I mean, the evolution of TV drama, and that's mm. why we want to focus on the writers. Yeah. So. Um, maybe thing. we could add that it's 200,000 Swedish crowns, the price, yeah. so it's 20,000 euros. Nice money. And it goes directly to the main writer or the nominated writers. Exactly. Yeah. So Sia, do you want to say something about the selection? It's five series, one from each Nordic country. Uh, yes, this is the best part of our work, <laughs> when we get to see all these fantastic series. And well, I mean, it was a high quality this year. They're a strong script. And there, I think that they bring new layers to classic uh, Nordic noir, for example, and also there's room for other new types of stories. So I would say that uh, th that it it keeps a high level, and, mm. and uh, I hope it will continue that way because I think uh, for the future, I think there is not so much room for for bad drama. I think the audience really, as uh, Walter Iussolini said yesterday, there's no, no, the audience just wants good drama and they know, and they know it and uh, yeah. Mm. So let's take a look at the, the nominated series and writers. So please come up on stage. I think we have a, yes. Okay, okay. Let's see, so this is, um, Charlotte Karin from The Lawyer, you're Bjorn, right? Yeah, borderliner. And then uh, there we have Adam Friese, the Danish nominee. Welcome up on stage. And here we have the Finns, Kirsi Porka, and your Jari or yeah, and your Rike. Okay, perfect. So some of you will be back on stage to to. to and what about the Icelandic? Uh, Nominees, there you are, Johan and Nana Christine. Welcome. So, why don't you come a little bit more to this side? Now, let's give a warm welcome to our nominated screenwriters. <laughs> okay. When there's a competition, of course, you need a jury. So, now I want to ask uh, this year's jury to come up on stage. So first we have Walter Usolino, he's CCO at GSN and of course curator of the eponymous streaming boutique service Walter Presents. So welcome Walter, head of the jury. <laughs> and um, you're going to be on stage later today for the Nostradamus seminar as well. But um, Okay, and the next one we have is actress Sofia Helene, of course playing Saga in Brun. Welcome. <laughs> And you will also be on stage tomorrow for the big grande finale on Brun that we are doing. And then, last but not least, the Finnish uh, journalist Kirpi Uimonen Balesteros. Uh, Finnish journalist based in LA, working for the Hollywood Foreign Press Association and also producing the podcast HFPA Conversations. And is it okay if I say the names or is it? See, yeah, yeah. So the first uh, guests will be first Steven Spielberg and then Susan Sarando. So it's 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 big names in in that podcast that can be found on GoldenGlobes.com because of course that's what the organization is is mostly known for the Golden Globes. 
Okay, so I want to know, you're going to announce the price later tonight, but what have the discussions been like? Has it been heated? Uh, it's been quite fascinating hmm? uh, in that we gathered at lunch and uh, we met for the first time there, <clears throat> having spent the past few weeks digesting a lot of scripts and watching a lot of episodes. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Sophia uh, came forward with it and said, I have, a, I have a clear thought about what I want to win. And she was completely dead serious determined, almost like your character. So I was thinking, oh gosh. Uh, and I said, well, that's funny because I, I have a very precise um, opinion too. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and, and the same for you. And I, <clears throat> I thought, oh my God, let's hope we agree. And, and I said, do you have this sort of option two or option three in case we... And she went like, no, I don't. <laughs> And I said, well, funny, it's the same with me. <laughs> <laughs> so we were mildly scared for the rest of the afternoon, and then we gathered at 6.30. And uh, I've got to be honest, it was a strange thing, because I didn't want to volunteer my point of view. I said, oh, you start, in case I had to patch it up and pretend that we could find a way to agree. But it was a fascinating. We had a, a very long uh, three, three and a half hours of discussion. And actually, we unpicked everything. We, we agreed on our overall direction. But uh, there was a lot of interesting discussion about the rest, wouldn't you say? Yes. It was. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> so, um, Walter, there's a lot of people that are, are interested in TV drama, obviously, in this room, but I think you might, you and Kirpi might be the ones that are seeing absolutely the most. You've seen, I think you said yesterday at lunch that you see 5,000 hours. Yes. I've seen four years, though. So yeah, yeah, but time. still. Um, so how would you say that this series kind of fair in the in this uh, world of seeing a lot of things. They were exceptional. I mean, you know, it, it, it's no secret, and I haven't invented the genre, it's all you guys, uh, that, that the Nordic Noir has been at the forefront of, of real innovation and, and quality for the past few years. And, and if anything, there's always, uh, there was always going to be a bit of a crisis at the point where you're a bit of a victim of your own success because the market is asking you, producers and, and you commissioners, to deliver. Uh, sort of forests and dead girls. And so it, it, there's been a lot of those. And, 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 and some of the tropes tend to become repetitive after a while, and not, and not for anyone's fault. So I think that what a, a lot of what we had this year was actually quite innovative and in pushing the envelope and the boundaries. And that's interesting. It's interesting to see that a successful commercial culture is still able to reinvigorate itself and renew mm. itself. And I thought a lot of that was in this year's nominations. Cool. So you can give the mic to Sophia. Oh, you're an actress, so yeah. and uh, now actually also a producer, right? Um, so I guess you're coming into this with a, another kind of perspective. How does it affect your viewing? I'm not sure if that's true, because we as actors also see the whole picture, mm. of course. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, maybe we look more precisely on the dialogue and how it would, possible, it would be possible to play it mm. and what would be the challenges. And uh, I was so happy when I heard this um, uh, the previous talk because that's uh, just what you aim for as an actor to to be able to to go into the process a bit earlier on in order to not have to think when you get the script oh how will i solve this how will i deliver this information without just deliver information mm. you know so uh, maybe i have a little bit of different way of looking at it but i think uh, we all look at the whole story. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah. So, Kirpa, I just want to ask you, you, you see drama from all over the world, so sure. what would you say is unique about this Nordic series that you watched for this? Well, for sure, one thing is very unique is that everybody in the world thinks that we come from the best countries in the world, and we do really dark series and movies. So that's one unique point, what is really hard to explain to other people around the world, why we always take that dark um, path. And they think that it's because of the weather. And I agree with that. So that's one unique point. The other one is that all the female characters, leading and supporting, they always have depth in the character. So that makes them more interesting to audience. Mm. So I just want to, your collective taste will be known at the award ceremony tonight, of course, but could you just, each of you say a favorite Nordic series from before? So we kind of get maybe a taste of what you like. Yeah, I'm, I'm really bad with this because I've been living abroad 15 years. So well, I you can say an international series. That's okay, fine. let me, let's go straight to there. I have to say Breaking Bad because there is no boring moment in that TV show. Hmm? 
What about Sophia? Uh, can I also take an international one? Yeah, it's yeah. okay. Thanks. Uh, I just uh, love the latest um, um, Top of the Lake. Mm. Yeah. The second season. Mm? Walter? Can I say a few? You get, <laughs> you get special permission. No, no, I'd say my all-time all -time favorite show of all time uh, is a three-part uh, HBO uh, show from the Czech Republic. It's called Burning Bush. Mm. And it's directed by Agnieszka Holland. Yes. And, uh, and that would be probably my all-time favorite in terms of scripted. Um, but if, if it comes to Nordic, uh, it's a difficult one because, because there's so much vitality and, and, and energy within, within a lot of the brands that have come out of um, these countries over the past few years. But I would say, rattling through, um, I... <clears throat> Uh, uh, eyewitness, I loved because I thought it was a, a, a sort of a love story about sort of sexual identity mm. and tragedy. The, the Norwegian Mast, one about the young yes, but Mars is a crime again. thriller. But I like the fact that it's not a crime thriller. That the story is, is linear, but there's a real big subtext, mm. subtext there. Uh, I was discussing yesterday with somebody who commissioned it. Uh, I think Before We Die is an excellent Swedish thriller, mm. and I deliberately don't want to name the killing and the bridge because we all know them and love them very mm. much. But I think it's interesting sometimes to champion the slight underdog. And I found that an Anglo-American audience hasn't been able to quickly get something like Before We Die, but I think, again, it's a great show because it's not a crime thriller, it's a show about mother and son relationship, and so that there's, a, there's an interesting emotional depth to it. Mm. Uh, Borgen, I think, was extraordinary because mm. it made uh, politics human, and it was 10 years of its time. Mm. Uh, uh, but my all-time uh, Scandi uh, show would be the first season of The Legacy. Because mm. I think that that's a kind of, a, I mean, it's an exquisite premise, the idea of a sort of Louis Bourgeois type older artist who dies and leaves a crumbling artistic empire to a florist is un incredibly beautiful and very bold. So mm. that's my favorite. So thank you. We will see you on stage for the award ceremony tonight. <laughs> you. OK, so ne now let's have a some of the nominated screenwriters back up on stage to talk about their writing and their series. So we have five nominated series, and we saw, um, we saw the trailer montage, but I really think we should also see the, the proper trailers and talk about this series. And um, well, first of all, congratulations, of course. Thank you very much. Um, and we're just going to do this alphabetically according to the name of the series so that it feels feels democratic and good so we're going to start with you Jan okay so we have one chair too much sure maybe Adam you can move in and we'll and you want okay and then this is some imaginary Screenwriter. Okay, so we start with the Borderliner, the Norwegian series you're nominated together with Megan Gallagher and Alexander Opsal. And um, I, I thought we'd do it like this. I introduce the writer, we look at the trailer, then we talk a little bit about the series. So you other people, you're just going to have to sit in and listen until it's your turn. Okay, so you're, you're one of the writers on this series and you have a background as a journalist. Yes, a long time ago. Yes. Give him a mic. Oh, uh, a mic. And you co-wrote the drama series Valkyrian for NRK, and there was a right. big success. It won the Norwegian TV Prize Gullrut, and it was also on BBC's top ten list of series 2017. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. So that's some background on you. Uh, so there, there's a murder that takes place, but the core of the story is really something else. Right, can you tell us what it's about? Yeah, so this is about the <coughs> uh, good, honest cop from... Oslo, uh, played by Tobias Santelman, who comes back to his hometown, uh, starts an investigation of a possible murder, and soon discovers that his family is involved in the case. And so, it, to avoid his brother's children, who he loves dearly, to actually lose their father, he decides to do a small, there's a small cover-up he can do in the investigation to make it all pass, make it all go away. Uh, and his co-investigator starts suspecting something else is afoot, starts, keeps the case open, and so Nikolai, the main character, is caught in a kind of doubled game on duty where he has to investigate the case while at the same time um, protecting his family, and then it turns out his family has also been lying to him or setting him up. So it's, um, it's, it's a family drama in a kind of crime package, right? Yeah, so it's a crime sort of a format, and there is a Oh, it's a puzzle leading from episode to episode of what's going to happen, but the core of the story f for us was always the secrets in the family, that everybody in this family is, is keeping their own secrets, including the main character. Mm. 
We will talk about more about um, uh, crime and reinventing crime like Walter mm -hmm. um, uh, from the jury said, but let's go over to the next mm -hmm. uh, series. So that's the Finnish series, Dead Wind. Uh, and we have uh, Kirsi Porkka here. Maybe you can pass the mic to her, Bjorn. Yeah, and you're you. nominated together with uh, Jari Ola Verantala and um, Rike Jokela. So you're a screenwriter and also a playwright with several yes. plays that have been performed at the National Theatre in Helsinki. And now you've written this crime series for TV. So she's a, a female police officer. Um, what is it you wanted to explore with this story? Uh, um we wanted to tell the story about a woman who has lost uh, her husband, as Karpi uh, has. Uh, she comes back to Finland. She has been in Germany for one year with, with her family. And by accident, uh, her husband dies. And the, uh, the main question for us all the time was how to survive when someone you love beloved dies suddenly mm. and uh, this theme is there are many small stories around, around the same theme mm. but this was the main question because um, when there is a, a loss like that uh, it takes time to recover and you live in kind of mm, uh, in between stage you're not in your daily life anymore uh, the illusion of continuity has collapsed, yeah. but uh, you have to you have to try to uh, find new balance and to somehow to uh, you have to try to find the this illusion of continuity again. And uh, Sofia, when she comes to Finland, she goes back to the work and she balances with the work and the family with her children because now she's alone mm. and uh, tries to make it better um, and then she found finds a body a woman who is at the same age than she is and all this comes up again most of these series except yours uh, right upon the storm are in a kind of like crime package uh, so so how did you go about um, uh, securing that you're not going to just do these tropes and cliché, how, how to kind of reinvent the story. Let's start with Karin and Charlotte, the one, the, nominees, the uh, Swedish nomination, the lawyer. Yeah, uh, we received this idea from uh, creators, Jens Lapidus, Hans Rosenfeld and Mickey Hjort. Mm. And Hans Rosenfeld, of course, is here because he's going to be in the grand finale uh -huh. on Braun, the creator uh -huh. of Braun. He's, uh, at least he was here last night. He's somewhere in the okay. room. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the idea is not about the police finding a dead body. It's about uh, two siblings um, who saw their parents be murdered when they were children and uh, then deciding to find the, the killer and have their revenge. Ignore. So it's not a typical... Um, crime story with the police investigation. Mm. So that's how we avoided the, the typical uh, cliches of the genre and instead had a lot of problems telling a story because a police investigation is very straightforward mm. and this was not. This was an undercover story. Mm. So that was um, the challenge and the thing that was new about it. Mm. I, I wanted to ask you, Johan, if you, if you take the mic, uh, now we haven't seen the footage from Stella Blomqvist, but it's it's Nordic noir, but it's actually more like classical noir, like 40s noir. For example, sh there's a voiceover that is very classical noirish. Wh wh why did you want to tell the story like that? Yeah, we were also trying to move away from the basic tenets of a, of a crime story, but instead of going away from it, we went back to the roots of it yeah. and uh, looked at old noir films, looked at Agatha Christie, went for the more classical style of storytelling, but tried to modernize it and make it more energetic and more entertaining. Mm. And yeah, that was both a challenge and, and the fun part of it mm. was you know, trying to break new ground with old materials. Yeah. And yeah, that was a joy. What about you, Bjorn, and, uh, and your colleagues? Uh, well, for us, we always wanted to uh, move it in the direction of the family drama, but there was always the, the challenge for us while working on the on the series was how to get 
to flesh out as much as possible, what was possible in the, ooh, you can hear me, um, what was possible between the characters when so much of the logic of crime series are often much more plot driven and mm -hmm. puzzle driven. So there was a constant uh, sort of back and forth challenge of having the scene set up as dramatically as possible, but still not um, giving away what would be plot points for the audience or mm. to work on both levels. Um, and I think that's a particular challenge when you're trying to reinvent the crime series and you want to bring out more emotions and more characters. There's something about the logic of crime series itself that doesn't lend itself w so well to the kind of drama that Adam, for example, has, has written, I think, where it's much more about really leading the audience into the scenes with the kind of information that makes them live through it emotionally mm. in some way feeling charged by what you are watching on screen whereas uh, a lot of the logic of crime is often about keeping information hidden mm. um, so that was a, that was a particular challenge for mm. uh, and of course there, there's similarities that your Stella Blomqvist is a lawyer mm -hmm. and yours is about a lawyer so not about cops <laughs> So please, please grab some mics. Uh, so it's about this siblings couple. It's uh, the guy is a lawyer, the brother is a lawyer, and the the, the sister is a cop. Um, but what's the show really about? What's the core? What's the theme? What are you exploring? Wow, what a difficult <laughs> question. Uh, it's about revenge. Um, but I think for me, it's about a uh, very troubled brother and sister who are finding each other again mm. through the journey towards revenge. That's what's, what was at the heart for in it for me. Mm. What would you say? Yeah, and then also because it's about law and justice. It's you can keep the mic a little bit closer. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's about law and justice because he's a lawyer and he has he has very high morale and, and ethics from the beginning, but to reach his goals, he has to break the law and bend the rules. And, and it's also about the price of revenge, um, what, mm. has, what he has to give. Mm. So let's go over to the next one and tell us about the original idea for Right Upon the Star and why you wanted to tell this story. Well, um, well first of all, this is, this is really not an attempt of, of going into the the Nordic Noir. It is, in fact, no, no dead girls and, and, and woods at all. Uh, so it was actually uh, an attempt to, to break completely different ground. Um, and after having worked with Borgen for 30 episodes, very much about a mother-daughter relationship, I felt I also had something to say about fathers and sons. Mm. And, um, and that fitted very well with our uh, big ambition to speak about religion, because I really do believe that religion still has very uh, huge uh, importance in this world. And um, it is, for me, driven by curiosity, because I want to understand religion. Mm. I mean, just see what happens when Trump moves his embassy to, uh, to Jerusalem. I mean, uh, to, to, uh, to understate the importance of religion in this world is really to, uh, to mistake the whole thing. Mm. So um, yes, I really wanted to go into this question about religion, but at the core of it, it's very much a story about fathers and sons, about a family, about the fate year in a family's life where everything changes. Mm. We all know uh, these years where we can say there was a definite before and after this very year when somebody died, when big decisions were made, when we were different afterwards as people. Mm. And of course, a lot of it is based on Christian myths. So you could say that it is a, it's a brother story, which is very much based on uh, Cain and Abel. Mm. And it's also a father and son story, very much based on the myth of Abraham and Isaac. Mm. So basically, are we willing to sacrifice our children for God? for our religion, and you could say that God uh, is both God in a religious sense, but is also our constant longing for meaning in our lives, and how we are willing to sacrifice something which is, at, uh, which is the most important in our lives. Mm. Basically, a story about how easy it is to destroy our children, either through love or expectation, mm. or the very poisonous mix of the two. Mm. And uh, basically, let's not destroy our children. Mm. Let's watch the trailer. 
So I go to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> okay. It's the next to last time. Uh, how did you, uh, what was the writing process of Right Upon the Star? Well, we we also, uh, I've written this, had the privilege of writing it with uh, f very few writers. So uh, the writer, Paul Bell, who also did a lot of uh, uh, family shows in, in Denmark and did a very successful uh, Christmas show. And uh, Karina Damm, who uh, did uh, the big uh, story of uh, the big family story called Summer, mm -hmm. uh, and several other shows. And recently, uh, we've been joined on the team, which is obvious with this uh, topic, uh, by a, a priest son, okay. uh, <laughs> who is actually a was play, it like a, a fact playwright. checker or well, it was it was just uh, it was just obvious that he had the necessary <laughs> qualities because he was kind of brought up in a family of priests, both his mother and father. Uh, have been priests, so that okay. has been quite. A, you talk about a mother and father complex. That well, anyway, <laughs> uh, so so yeah, so a small writers' room, uh, and uh, Karina Damm has been um, my closest partner all through the process. An amazing writer, and mm. uh, and a very 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 close uh, relationship between the writers' room, the directors, uh, the production, which mm -hmm. is kind of core values in in the DR system. Mm, and it's an in-house production. It's an in-house production, yeah. yeah. But we've had uh, <coughs> uh, partners, uh, Arte France uh, and uh, and uh, Studio Canal. Mm, um, and your production company? Uh, yeah, you? my company, um, uh, Sam, Sam Productions. Yeah, yeah. yeah our French, uh, the, the, we have a French company called uh, Sam mm. Le Francais. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they've taken part in the co-production. Yeah. 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 Okay, so let's go to uh, the last nominated series, Stella Blomqvist and Johan, um, nominated writers, and we met Nana Kristen before, and then of course we have um, Ottarsson, what's his uh, first name? Andre Ottarsson. Andre, exactly. So you're the head writer, and you're also, also head of development at Saga Film, the production company of the of the series. It's um, based on best-selling books. Yes. So how did you go about adapting it to a uh, um, series? We went very freely about it. The books are very pulpy and uh, basically written in a style of old detective novels. Mm. And we sort of, sort of wanted to steer into that style as much as possible. Um, we used the first book as a main story for our first part, but these are three stories. Mm. And uh, we made up the second two stories whole cloth and uh, so, yeah, those aren't part of the books, and they, those aren't part of the series, but uh, we're using mostly the character of Stella, mm. uh, which is a fun character to write for, because she's a kick-ass lawyer who, who does whatever she please, mm. ple and, yeah, wants to break rules as much as possible. Mm. And you brought up uh, character, and that really segues me into my next question, which is about characters, because characters is often the thing one remembers about drama series. So I would like the, anyone who wants to answer the question, talk about character building. Maybe since you're holding the, the mic, can start. Uh, yeah, Stella Blomqvist as a character is, is kind of hard to define, but she's almost made up of all the things that women aren't supposed to traditionally be doing mm. uh, without becoming like a masculine or a feminine version of a man. She is allowed to do whatever she pleases, and that was the main kind of building block of the character. Mm. And then we have to kind of construct around that and, and give her a backstory, give her a motive, give her a life, uh, which is a long and arduous process, but uh, yeah, it's, it's it happens slowly, but surely in the writer's room. Mm. I don't know if you want to continue. Yeah, oh, yeah thank you. Uh, well, the, the main character of, uh, of Ride Upon the Storm is, uh, is played by Lars Mikkelsen. Mm. And he is a very high-profiled uh, priest in, uh, or minister uh, in, um, in Denmark. Uh, in the state church. In the state church yeah. of Denmark, which in itself is a quite an interesting institution. Yeah, uh, because I mean, uh, it has 77% members of the Danish population. Yeah, um, but and we are not such, going a, there such, that a, much, right? such a secular nation. Yeah. You know? but still, our queen ends our uh, the New Year's speech every year with "God bless Denmark" or mm. "God protect Denmark." 
So we can always discuss how secular we in fact are. But anyway, uh, uh, just as you said, with your character being everything that a woman should not be, um, well, uh, I think Johannes is very much everything that a priest should be, and at the same time, everything that a priest shouldn't be. There are certain rules and regulations regarding how a priest should act. Of course, a priest should always be kind of respectful, uh, a respectful figure. And, uh, and the character of Lars Mikkelsen is a, is a man who, who suffers from, he's probably maniodepressive, uh, he's an alcoholic, he has frequent affairs, but he's also a wonderful priest. In fact, we've tried writing him as if he were a great artist, basically. And he is. I mean, he preaches like no one else, mm. but at the same time, he is uh, committing adultery and drinking and almost destroying his sons because of the huge pressure he puts upon them. Mm. Yeah? Bjorn, you want to elaborate on your main character, the Tobias Sandman? Well, okay. we had, uh, like, our process was a bit unusual with the borderliner. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if there's any normal in this industry, because I find that making TV drama is a bit of an extreme sport mm. in any case. Um, but I would say normally I would write up from the beginning, there's a very linear process from a, a core of a character that you start fleshing out and that later on is then cast and then put into production and so on. Mm. In this case, we had, uh, we had casting had started before we were at the end of the story and really knowing what all the characters were about. So mm. in some cases, like with the main character of Nikolai that Tobias Santelman plays, we always knew that was our core also, the one we clutched onto. He's the moral center of the story mm. and he's the one who's put into uh, kind of jeopardy. Uh, but for all the supporting character characters around him, to get the most out of them, uh, we also brought in the actors and were close with directors in terms of interpreting who they were and fleshing them out as we shot. So mm. we were actually watching some of the shooting while we were still writing. We had a very, uh, a very non-linear kind of uh, process. Uh, Sounds intense. This. So instead of being sitting in a writing room with a big blank board and just sort of envisioning up something and then feeding it down the line and eventually it ends up on the screen, we were much more in close proximity to the production. Mm. Uh, and some of the actors contributed considerably to finding the kinds of nuances that we could play with. And our ambition in writing the show was really about making it as credible as possible and not necessarily to construct uh, a, a universe that was sort of uh, perfectly written. We had no time for a perfectly written show. We had just time to make it as um, uh, as lively and as exciting as possible and as close to the characters as we could f to make them appear real on screen. Mm. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit about Sofia Karp? You already talked a little bit about yes. her, but how did you find that that character? Uh, we used a lot of time of discussion with Yari and Enrique, and um, and finding out uh, what kind of woman we are, we, are, we want to tell story about, mm. and in the end, there are a couple of strong women. And the, the actress wasn't uh, cast at this uh, Rike, point. Or? Rike is directing, so of course we have this opportunity to talk mm. at the same time the screenwriter and the director, mm. which which helps. Uh, but I was telling them about that uh, we have a couple of strong uh, women there in the story. Another one is this uh, murdered woman, Anna, mm. and we get to know Anna quite well uh, after ep episode and episode. Mm. So there was also um, challenge to s um, this challenge how to make Anna alive because she's not um, in a real time show they're performing. Yeah. So, so that's, all the that's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How to make her as alive as possible, so that in the end, audience knows her well. Mm. And and um, I think that it's interesting moment when you, as a writer, know that now I know enough from this person that I can, I'm able to write about her. Mm. But it takes time. Mm. So, for you. Mm. Um, so your main character is Frank, the lawyer. Yes, that's Frank, the lawyer, and um, yeah, he's the main character of the story. And um, I would say that he evolved as characters always do in great uh, proximity to the involvement of the plot, because um, we have to give the character certain uh, traits to be able to drive the plot forward, mm. since it's not his—he's not a police officer. It's not his job 
to, uh, to find out what happens to his parents. He's just a person. And what kind of person does that? Um, and also, we had to, to put him together with his sister and, and give her certain traits so that they were different from each other, mm. but with the same driving force. So it, it's really a give and take. And there are several versions of Frank uh, mm. that, that evolved during our work. Yeah. And then, of course, when the directors and the, the actor came in, there was a totally new Frank mm. that we didn't expect to see. And which was, it's beautiful when that happens. When you, oh, there he is. Oh, he was a little bit like that. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, that's how it works. And I was just thinking about character development. I would like to say that the, the most fun, uh, one of the most fun things with this project was, was that when we tried to de develop the, the bad guys, the antagonists, and we didn't want to make them too much stereotypes, we started giving them lives and, and loves and, and, and problems. And they're just wonderful now. I just love them so much. <laughs> uh, and they're such bad people. And that was a nice journey to follow through the episodes. Starting episode one, that's a bad guy. And in episode 10, I feel for him. My God, what he's been through. Mm -hmm. And that was fun. That was a fun thing to, to experience. They grew, a lot. they grew a lot during the process. I mean, they were not in this plot as much. They were more in the background doing bad things, and we knew that. But then we gave them more and more scenes because we started to love them so much. So that was fun. <laughs> so they have their own They life. took over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we have to wrap this up. Uh, and I want to... Thank you all for coming. I want to thank you especially for this exercise part of, of and uh, I want to thank the audience for the patience and the technicians for, for fixing it in the end. And now we're going to take a half hour break. Uh, there's some food served outside and we will start uh, a quarter to two sharp and then we're going to hear from Brian Pearson at Netflix. So be back for that. <laughs> <laughs>